Uh, I will talk today about how you can design interactions for a rather functional case for engineers in virtual reality, but you can also, from the talk, learn a lot about interactions in general when it comes to functional content. So Virtual Spice, as you see, Embodied Engineering, is the spin-off from Salt and Pepper, and Salt and Pepper is an engineering company, that's why we have the focus mostly on engineers. And what we are trying to do at Virtual Spice is building a software to help engineers do their everyday work with VR. So, building interactions for VR is um, a very interesting topic. And it is, in fact, um, rather normal to develop games. You have a lot of fun with them, and also you can play around and you can be creative. But when it comes to a functional tool, let's say you use Photoshop. Photoshop is something that is rather strict. You have menus, you kind of want to know where everything is, and it's not so playful as a game. A game can sometimes use um, certain elements to distract you. The menu can wobble, things can change. But a functional tool that you're doing for someone to be uh, actually used in a professional uh, use case has to be quite um, different. So I was, had just a great introduction. I will just skip the slide. Mm. And also this one. And start first with the definitions. What is embodied cognition? The cognition is, in fact, our ability to perceive the world, right? And also our mind, our consciousness. And why is the embodied cognition um, so important for VR? Because the theory of embodied cognition means that what we are doing around us is changing the way how we think. So you can have a view on the brain, and the view on how we perceive the world and how our minds and thoughts are formulated completely without the external world. This is rather a different approach. But embodied cognition is implying that the world around you is changing how you think. When you interact with the world, it, you change the way your thoughts are formed. And also, you cannot view how cognition works without the external world. The Uncanny Valley, who doesn't know it? Okay. Uh, the Uncanny Valley is the effect that when you, for example, design robots way too precise and way too human-like, they look creepy. Why is it happening? Because they somehow are humanoids, they look very human-like, but we still can pick up certain mm, errors in them. They, they cannot behave like a real human. They don't have this mimics. They don't have those smooth movements like I do right now. And this is called the uncanny valley, when something becomes way too much similar to what it represents, but on the other hand, we still can pick up the inconsistencies. Affordances. Let's say you grab a bottle. And when I grab it, this is the affordance. I can grab something. I can hold it. I can open it. So an object can have different interactions that you can do with it. And those are the affordances that an object has. Visual fidelity. Visual fidelity means that um, you can have something very detailed, like you can model this bottle in 3D completely like it is, with every shape. Or you can have an abstract visualization with a lower visual fidelity of the bottle itself, where it is just a shape. VR itself with HMDs is in fact increasing the visual fidelity dramatically, because you don't have a screen anymore, but you can look around. Then there is also interaction fidelity. Let's say this is my controller in VR, right? And I want to grab the bottle. I will have a trigger here on the Vive controller. I will just hold it. I will pick up the bottle. So this is the interaction. When I would have the Manus Globe Zone or Elite Motion or any other technology that tracks my fingers, I can obviously program my interaction that I have to actually grab it. So if I would do this, it doesn't work. If I do somehow this or this, it doesn't work. I have to grab it. And the, hence the interaction fidelity for this bottle would be higher if I actually would use the affordances very similar to the ones in the real world. And then there is embodied engineering. This is a term that we came up with because we want to embodify, how we call it, yeah, it's funny, a little bit, um, to embodify the engineers in VR to give them the ability to be in a certain place and perceive the workspace that they are designing the machines from the eyes of a blue color worker. So, our main focus right now is, for example, the um, uh, optimization of factory layouts. And when you have a factory layout, you plan it on your screen, so lower fidelity than VR. You can, in, you can just view it, you can move with the mouse. But just imagine you just throw in all your 
CD files in VR, you put on the HMD, and you can actually try yourself out. How is it to assemble something? I have to take something, I have to put it somewhere else, I have to interact with it. And because embodied cognition implies that the world around you changes the way you think, or actually defines the way you think, embodied engineering implies that when you try out the things that you design before you actually build them, it might help you and it will help you to build them better. That's why you actually do mock-ups, right? That's why you do early stage prototypes. Because as good as a designer you are, as good as a production planner you are, you still need to see how it would work out in the real world because, well, a screen is just too abstract. Now coming to display fidelity and interaction fidelity and why it's actually important. Um, there is a great paper called Evaluating Display Fidelity and Interaction Fidelity in Virtual Reality Games. It's a quote. Uh, from there, I want to uh, show you the result of our study indicates that both display interaction fidelity significant uh, and um, so both display and interaction fidelity significantly affects strategy and performance as well as subjective judgments of presence, engagement, and usability. That basically means that if you choose different ways to interact with the virtual environment, it will basically change the way how a user performs. You want him to focus more on the small details, you have a high visual fidelity. You want him to rather see the big picture, you have a very low visual fidelity. And the same goes for interaction. Now, interaction, uncanny valley. There is another great paper called The Uncanny Valley of Virtual Reality Interactions. And what they have been researching is how, what we usually know from robots, if the robots become too human-like, right, and we perceive them creepy, does it apply also to the interaction? So when the interaction is just very, very similar to the real world, but on the other hand, just not perfect enough because VR cannot provide yet a perfect interaction exactly the same as in real life, how does it affect the human? Does he like it? Does he not like it? Should we rather go abstract? Where is the threshold? And what they found out is that semi-natural interactions are worse for user performance than low-fidelity interactions that do not resemble real-world actions and high-fidelity interactions. Basically, if you have, again, hand tracking, and you program very, very good this grabbing, but someone is grabbing it that way, and you would have the collider of the hand, basically here, and you would really, because in VR is that way, you wouldn't really need to grab it that way, but, but you kind of grab it, you know, just with your tips of the finger, and it doesn't work. You feel tricked, you don't like it. Your brain says, hmm, I don't like it, it's somehow, it's very strange, I don't like this interaction. But again, if you would just have the controller and the grip, you just grab it like that, the bottle goes up, you're kind of satisfied. It's not perfect, but you kind of accept that it's not perfect. That's why we like cartoons. Cartoons don't have to obey laws of physics, and we still accept them as something where we like, watch, and also enjoy the um, things in there. Now, interaction uncanny valley for engineers, again. Um, you have a lot of different software that helps you to visualize those objects that you are designing as an engineer, right? You have different machines, different parts, and um, you have a range of visualizations there. But uh, you still, as I already mentioned before, need to prototype, because it doesn't substitute it. And um, you could do cardboard engineering where really engineers just walk in a real room. It's a very valid method, and a lot of people are doing it. And they build the whole factory out of cardboard. Factory. There are a lot of grown-up men going into a place, putting cardboard there, and looking how the layout will work, which is a great method, actually. It helps a lot to understand how the flow of different parts will be in the factory and on the other hand, also to see if the ergonomy is right. Do I have to grab something from here? Do I have to bend a lot? And um, it generates, obviously, high costs. You have to get a room, you have to get the cardboards that are quite expensive, they're special. You have to get a certified specialist. And even if you just drop the cardboards and just do an early stage prototype, it also costs even more money because you kind of are building up the machines. And now imagine you're kind of safe on those steps. You're saying, OK, I have the great engineers in the world, and you build up a factory, and it's not effective. You're losing money again. Um, there are also a certain issues with um, communication problems between people. You need to get them in a room, they need to look at the mock-up, and VR could solve it, right? And um, if you would imagine for one second that instead of doing it in real life, you kind of want to have early stage prototypes in VR, right? You would kind of assume, OK, awesome. Now we can take all the machines we have and just model the factory one to one with all those precise interactions. Let's just also grab a coworker or a blue collar worker and let him even train those fine movements with screws and everything. 
Well, the fact is that VR is not ready yet to have a very one-to-one -one simulation of the real world, right? So when you would try to go way too far and create something too realistic, you would lose the benefits that you gain through using virtual reality instead of early stage prototypes. Why, why is it the case? You don't have force feedback. You cannot really feel the things around you. I mean, you can touch a mock-up. You can actually put something on it. You can you know, feel it with your body. But in VR, it's still tricky. There are certain solutions like Haption. There's like a basically big robot arm. There are other startups working on different ways to interact and feel the environment, but we are still not there. And even if we are there, it's quite cost intensive. And through saving money on the early stage prototype, you still need to buy all those expensive devices. We still don't have proper full body tracking, right? I mean, if you want to track the person cost effectively on a large scale, in a big room with a lot of other people, it's kind of tricky. Like, you can do it with you know, certain motion capturing cameras, but it's, but it's just not effective. And also, you will get in the way. Hand tracking, there are many solutions. Leap motion, the Manus gloves, and even more. But they still are not perfect and sometimes lose fingers. And they are not resembling one-to-one -one the real movement that my hand is doing, if I would like to put it one-to-one -one at least. Um, you also have visual feedback from your body. You kind of see where your body is. That's why this whole tracking is important. And you kind of also feel the world around you when you work with early stage prototypes or prototypes or machines and you can figure it out. I mean, I kind of need to crawl inside a machine, take a part out, and okay, if I just have the machine in VR, yeah, I kind of you know, can just walk through it, take the part out and walk out. I don't feel necessary that I just hit my head against a virtual wall, which is kind of painful. Now, what we um, have been experimenting a lot, we still don't have really the full answer yet, but we are trying to build up an affordances library that resembles a wag abstraction of certain movements that you do in VR that is good enough to do those early stage prototypes, but on the other hand, is not reaching the uncanny valley. So it's somehow in between low fidelity and high fidelity. In visualization and in interaction, you can you know, change the fidelity very easily. You just, you know, have other rather good and high fidelity or low fidelity. And um, what we kind of have in mind is a mixture between them. So it has to look like a factory, but it doesn't have to be, you know, very detailed. Not every screw has to be there. And in terms of interactions, well, it would be kind of boring if you push one button and everything is done, because you still kind of want to see how it is to, you know, perform those steps. But on the other hand, if you just, you know, just do it too good. As I told you, it's, it's kind of not doing it very well when you have the uncanny valley pro effect. So we have actually a demo with us where you can try a few things that we have been you know, working on. This is, for example, a robot that gives you a part, right? And this is the human robot in collaboration idea, which is right now coming more and more into factories. A and you could make the robot better. The, the robot is not really realistic. I mean, there is a very weird tube, right? And, you know, some parts are coming out, you just take them out, it, it hands it to you. But a robot would, in real life, move differently and also look differently. But in our understanding, this at least is fair enough. It's a good approximation of what we would like to do. Here, you have a rather um, tricky example, even though it doesn't look that way. You kind of grab a wheel and you need to assemble it to a chassis. And for example, if you take the wheel wrong, like you drop it, you pick it up, you cannot really stick, st stick the wheel to the car anymore, and people don't notice it. Because it kind of implies the shape of the wheel and the way we made it, that it's, you know, it should stick. It's a lo low fidelity interaction. You just take it and you put it. But because we added this idea that the wheel can only be one-sided, like if you, if you rotate it, you don't necessarily notice it, but you just can't apply it. And people are very confused by that. So we mixed here, the low fidelity of the wheel itself, you know, just grab it and put it on, with the high fidelity that the wheel doesn't fit with every side. And this sometimes leads to confusion. The screwdriver example is um, also an approximation of the real world. Technically, you would need to take the screwdriver, put it in this screw, and actually you would feel it, and you would slowly do this movement. In our experience, you can just take the screwdriver, do this. You don't even have to take the screwdriver out, and it's kind of working. 
If you would do it too fine, we would end up with a problem that you don't have the force feedback, and your hand is just shaking. You would never you know, get the screw. But if you would just have one button, you can you know, just do it, and it makes it itself, you would not perceive the step as something that is happening. So through the movement, you have, in fact, the embodied cognition effect. You kind of perceive, OK, I have to screw it. You remember it. But you don't necessarily do the full screwing movement as you would do in real world. Mm. Here we have the performance feedback that is also an approximation. There is just a paper. You pick it up, and you see how fast you build it a toy car. And it is kind of very abstract. There are some seconds. You, know, you could, for example, visualize all the different ways how you did it and show all the perfection. But we decided that you don't necessarily need that in that particular case. You just have seconds. How fast did you assemble the car? And if you do it faster, you have it faster. So it's itself also an approximation of your performance. Here we have the robot basically taking the car and bringing it away. And before that, you have to apply the chassis. And because we figured, OK, with wheels, it doesn't work well, we decided that the carrossery can be put at any side on the car. But it itself feels strange, because in the end, we have a fixed model. And it has to be that way, because the robot is going to bring it there, and there are other steps that are coming later on. So however you apply the carrossery on top of it, it will stick always to one side, which is fine and usually would not matter. But if you want kind of to simulate what's happening in a factory, it would be important. We also have another example where we experiment. Um, if you would like to train robots, how would you do it in VR, right? You could do it in, like in real life. You would just take a keyboard out, and you would program it with code. What we did is um, a great um, yeah, demo for showing how it can be done in VR. Yeah, you, know, you can just take the robot, guide it, save the step. And once again, it is not very precise, because you have the controller, you just do those movements, you save it. But if you would do it, again, too good, you could not play around with it. I mean, this won't give you information how to do it with a real robot itself, but you can test it out. See if the robot can reach the parts, how it's moving, whether it has to rotate a lot. So all this information that you kind of want to get, you're getting, but you're not losing too much on having a too perfect demonstration. Now, I mentioned the Manus Globes, and uh, we had the chance to try them out. We implemented them in our demo where you could use your hands and grab the wheels. The thing is, um, when you grab something, you kind of use your two fingers, right? Or you could grab it that way. And people were a little confused when they were trying out. Like they grab it with a hand, and they would put it on, and they would naturally do this movement. They would try to do it with their hand, or sometimes they were grabbing the screwdriver. But they were doing it way more precise and also careful than with the controller. But because they were trying to do something that is very natural in real life, it just wasn't working on VR. So the way how you try to screw changed. And we had also to change the scripts, because the scripts would normally detect how you would do it with a controller. And all the people do it very similarly. But with the hand tracking, you would really do this fine movement, which would not resemble our understanding and our experience how you would do it with a controller itself. There is also the problem of um, losing tracking. If you have an abstract environment, and sometimes the controller gets lost, or your hand gets lost, like with a leap motion, you kind of are accepting it, because the world around you seems imperfect, and imperfect, and imperfect things can happen. But if you would, once again, have a too high fidelity, and you would lose your hand, or you would have a part, and we also had this issue, and you would just grab it in your hand, and the, you kind of want to put it there. Like, you assume that the world around you functions the real world. You take something, you put it behind you. Well, the leap motion is usually on side of the head-mounted display, and it only can track the space, so it loses the hands. And well, if you lose the hand, then the object drops. Well, you could always say when the hand is lost, the object is always behind you. But sometimes the tracking is lost, and you kind of, or sometimes the person tries to drop it, and in the moment the tracking is lost, and then it, it is a, different, a difficult situation. And because it is a difficult situation, um, with a lower fidelity version, you make everyone more happy. You have to develop a little less, and on the other hand, the people are also perceiving, the users, it more realistic and more um, enjoyable. Yeah. OK. Any questions? Like, I know I've been talking a lot about in the engineering cases. Uh, this is our focus. But I'm pretty sure that this whole fidelity topic itself is very important for anything that goes beyond gaming. Like, 
in any way when you want to do something meaningful with VR. Like you want to plot something, you want to model something, you want to look at a real estate house. You kind of can try to make it perfect, but it looks, at least from the research side, that's rather where we don't have the perfect metric style system yet, you kind of should rather be okay with an approximation and accept it because it saves you time on development. You don't need to go perfectionist because you can't, because the devices can't give you the opportunity. And on the other hand, you're also doing the user a great favor. Questions? So um, do you have any ideas how to make uh, virtual properties look more real? To make it more immersive? So of both? Properties, more real. What can we do to make that? What properties, for example? Yeah, um, like houses, flats, real estates. Mm, I really okay. <laughs> uh, Well, you could um, you could make the door somehow swinging. I mean, you could add interactions to that because by it, cognition, we experience the world through interactions. When you would just have a 360 video of a house or a rendering, you kind of can look around, but you necessarily don't really have the feeling that I'm inside it. But when you would use a full tracking with the controllers of the Vive, and you could open up the door, turn on the water, you would add more immersion, and through the higher fidelity, the visual and also the interactual, you kind of have a better experience. But if you overdo it again, the people will notice that the door is wrong. Like, if you go the way you would go for the visual qualities of the architecture demo, and with the same attitude to the interactions, and do it also perfectly, you would still not be able to do it perfectly, and it would rather decrease the effect of the experience, I would say. Yeah. 